Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Sarita Cucumber and it feels so good to say that again. Did you miss me, you bunch of sad hoes? So, I feel like before we get into the actual main body of this video, we can't really ignore my basically four month long hiatus, but I get that some of you don't really give a shit about my personal life. Despite deeply offending me, as it should be the highlight of your day to listen to me rant, I'll allow it, so if you care about the content rather than the personality, then go and click on the time on screen now, and I'll get into the actual video you clicked here for. So, why did I choose to not upload for three months? Would you believe me if I told you that it is not indeed the result of the catastrophe out of my control or the global pandemic, but in fact, the fact that I am a lazy fuck? In this trying time, I think I've gone on a real spiritual journey and transcended to a higher way of thinking, breathing in the sweet smell of island gentrification and ruining the local ecosystem. I am thriving. And just as I believe I'm recovering from the numbing pain of Life is Strange 2, Don't Nod enters stage left with their title, Tell Me Why. Just when I thought my pain and suffering was over, well, here we go again. So, tell me why it happened. QQ's back, alright, and we are here to talk about my most burning question from the entirety of all three chapters of the recent release. The question that I'm asking myself, the question that you asked yourself, and the question that Tyler and Alison are still asking themselves after so long. What happened on the night of March 1st, 2005? Did Mary Ann really threaten Tyler with a shotgun? Was she gonna kill her own kids? Was Alison genuinely acting on impulse, or is Tom's story just a cover for his perfect campaign? And it's really the strongest question of the game, and interestingly, one we can never really answer. And in that spirit, no matter how much I try to narrow down what happened that night, I will never be closer to really figuring it out. And nobody ever really could, because that's simply how it's designed. But I'll be taking a look at this choice in depth and seeing how we could see things from both sides, weighing up the evidence, etc. So let's delve into this in the deep end. Our first factor is likely the most integral to the entire question, since she truly does uphold the entire question of motivation for the incident, and that's of Marianne Ronan. What was going through her head while she was loading that gun? Well, first and foremost, it's important to consider things from Marianne's perspective. At first, the game seems to throw a red herring at us that the event had something to do with Tyler's transition and cutting his own hair. While the game does throw some conflicting signals our way in the first chapter, we can safely determine that Marianne did not load the gun or do anything of this because of Tyler or his transition, giving her refusal of Tessa's offer of conversion therapy and her purchase of the Raising Your Transgender Child book, and her use of the name Ollie when referring to Tyler in her letter, we can assume that in a general sense she was cool with it. No, Marianne was loading that gun for far different reasons. Abandoned by the father of the twins, her ties cut with Tessa after months of staggered and delayed deaths, the final nail in the coffin being Tessa's phone call to Eddie, accusing her of theft and child neglect, Eddie's call to social services, and Sam's troublesome relationship with his wife. She had just made it through what may be the hardest winter of her life and she was running desperately low on money. Her stress was evident from her disconnect from her children. Suddenly, there were less conversations, less childhood memories to see. Marianne was cold and distant, and so were her goblins. After Leo's death, she felt the greatest fear of all come into her life again. She would once again need to bury her tiara and lose everything she'd worked so hard to rebuild, that without her children, she would simply be nothing. The Book of Goblins does a good deal of illustrating Marianne's struggle, and I'll definitely make a video on it at some point, but there is the detail to hang on to that the two thieves she met, meaning her children, were what helped her through these months and years, that not for Alison and Tyler, she would likely not have had a reason to live. On that night, what was going through her head? Well, she didn't know Tom was there, she was certain that her children were in bed, and she was alone in the night, loading a shotgun in her shed. Alison herself mentions, no matter which ending you choose, that Marianne was trying to kill herself. Another piece of evidence to back this up, 
though slightly meta, is the suicide prevention hotline information that's linked post-credits in Chapter 3, right after we truly relive the memories of that night, whichever way the player decides is canon. The real question lies in whether she was planning to take her children with her to the afterlife, or whatever version of it Marianne may or may not have believed in. I think, from Marianne's perspective, it's important to consider her love for her children. Despite being raised in what seems like a strictly wealthy, conservative household, she is genuinely making the effort to understand Tyler and his needs around the time of her death. This is evidenced by her stark rejection of Tessa's offer of conversion therapy, and of her book, which would have been extremely difficult to obtain in 2005. And indeed too for her daughter Alison, she would always put a strong effort into teaching her how to put her best foot forward in life and to embrace her creativity as a writer, a trait that has stuck with her long into the future. There is little doubt that Marianne unequivocally loved her children. This may have been masked at the time of her death by sheer amount of stress she was undertaking from the long winter, etc. The case made against her for child neglect seems like it was an intentional thing of Tessa's, as we never heard of any form of physical abuse in the household. But, that being said, she was forcing her children to steal by telling them that she had already paid for items and tricking them into doing this for her, not to mention the fact that she was emotionally unavailable. Would it be fair to say that Marianne had a valid case against her for child neglect? There is a possibility However, I can't help but feel that with the extension of a helping hand, Marianne could have been saved mentally before her demise. She could have been helped. It is even mentioned in one of the endings that Tessa had called the police with malice behind her after hearing about Marianne's affair with Tom. What this level of speculation does not change is the fact that Mary Ann was pushed to suicide. Given her love for her children, can we truly say she wanted to kill them? I would argue that she could have pulled a murder-suicide, and I do have my reasons for this. Considering things from Mary Ann's perspective, everybody was against her, and she was against everybody. She was not thinking clearly, and was in a state of mind where it could be safe to assume that she was not acting with reason at the forefront of her mental state. The important thing is though, that Marianne felt like everyone was against her. She was four days away from having social services called on her kids. If she had killed herself alone, who would they have to rely on in Delos Crossing? Who would take care of them? Tom, who didn't financially care at all, and didn't care about Marianne? Tessa, who'd reported Marianne to child services in the first place and was openly willing to send Tyler to conversion therapy. Eddie, who had struck the nail in the coffin on Marianne's death and by completely turning away from her in the name of following procedure and being a cop. Sam, who was already struggling and had enough on his plate with his drinking problem. Mary Ann loved her kids so much, and I think it was a dangerous kind of love. One of the twins mentions this in the game, that it seemed like Marianne loved them so much, it hurt her. We see Marianne at her lowest, seemingly intoxicated in Tom's store talking to Tessa. We see her babbling incoherently to herself as she shakily loads that shotgun, and we know that she isn't thinking rationally. Could it be that her love for her children is overriding her basic maternal instinct, and by doing this she somehow thinks she's saving them from a life that may be far worse for them? Now, of course, the counter-arguments to this definitely exist, the foremost and arguably most major of these being that Marianne's loft conversion in the barn left for the twins to discover her story. Why would Marianne kill her kids if it seemed like she was leaving so much for them to discover with their inquisitive minds? Is it really in character for her to do this, or did she plan on this being discovered after her death? And to it I agree, you know, it doesn't make sense until you consider that the barn was built years and years prior to Marianne's breakdown. She never had a reason to kill her children until recently, she had always found a way to get by until the last few months of her life, when her entire personality seemed to become sunken and damaged. Something changed between then and now, and it was the threat of losing her children. What is interesting is the fact that if Marianne wanted to kill Tyler, she probably would have already shot him by the time he was on his knees. There's also the possibility that she wanted to send him out with a goodbye first. We simply don't know that. Another counter-argument to Marianne's motivation to kill her children would be the way she addresses Tyler in the threatening version of the story. We'll get onto the line, I'm going to kill you later, as I think it opens up a very large kind of verbs in terms of the implications of the voice in the incident. But in general, this is not what a person would expect from a murder-suicide. Would Marianne really be so aggressive to her son? Would she not try and calm him down? And it's this specific detail that makes me think that it may not have happened. But I will certainly get into this in a later part of the video, as it could have happened, but not quite in the way that you're thinking. There's also the mention of what she said right after Alison stabbed her on the pier, right before she fell into the water and drowned. This isn't what. 
and then she's cut off by her untimely fall. What she was going to say may be where the mystery lies on her part given the context. What was she trying to communicate to Alison and Tyler? Well, it could simply be that she was trying to say the obvious, which would be, this isn't what it looks like, which would imply that Tom's version of the story is correct, and that she never meant to kill her children all along. Although this could be something else entirely, it could be that she meant to say, for example, this isn't what I wanted to happen, which may imply that she wished to take away the twins while they were sleeping. After all, she did have more ammunition out and ready to be loaded, but it's likely that her response was meant to be, this isn't what it looks like, given the context. Overall, it's hard to decipher because it's very open-ended, so we should probably take all of this with a bit of a grain of salt. Another thing that's important to consider is what Marianne would have said before this in Tom's version of the story. Now, it's important to mention that this is from Tom Vecchi's perspective, so discerning information from this source may be unreliable. However, we did hear Marianne babbling to herself even from Tyler's perspective, so this may have been a detail that remained true in both versions of the story. What did they do? They made me do it. They made me do it. Her words exactly are, oh god, what if they don't, they made me do it, they made me do it, do it, this is his fault, his fault. There is interesting information to be drawn from this in that Tyler may have misinterpreted his fault to mean that he had caused this and become defensive and scared of Marianne. But as we know, she was most definitely referring to Tom Vecchi. However, at the time, Tyler was still being referred to with she, her pronouns by Marianne. And so would he not have picked up on the fact that she was not talking about him? I think the real gem of information this gives us is an insight into Marianne's plans that night. What if they don't is clearly referring to a group of people here rather than an isolated individual with gender neutral pronouns based on the context. Perhaps she could be referring to the twins, in which case what if they don't is a much less open-ended way to start a sentence. Perhaps in some far delusion of her mind, Marianne thought she could convince her children to give up their lives willingly, which would lead into what if they don't want to or what if they don't want to go along with it. Perhaps she was worried about them surviving a gunshot and being in pain. Perhaps what if they don't die was her worry, which was further evidence her not wanting to kill them while awake and running away from her. But conversely, what if they don't could also mean what if they don't have anyone to take care of them, which would more than definitely imply her lack of willingness to hurt the twins, as there's somewhat of a contingency plan in mind there. Overall, I believe that Marianne was out of options, was desperately looking for a way out. Her faded mental state and her lack of consistency within personality throughout some of the flashbacks would really imply that she couldn't be trusted to consciously think in any frame of mind for an extended period of time, nor make rational decisions around the time of her death. She manages to pull herself together to serve ice cream to Alison and Tyler hours before her death, but at the time she seems like an incoherent mess, babbling to herself. What we do know is that she was planning to kill herself, and personally, I just think that the evidence points to the fact that she was planning to kill her children along with her, and to prevent another bitter loss, just as it had been with Leo dying as a baby. Whew, Mary Ann was one mess of a person. Time to move on to another mess of a person who carries a great deal of the emotional burden from that night. The second born of the Ronan twins, if Tyler's flirting with Michael is anything to go by. Alison has arguably a lot more insight into this situation as we see it from her perspective. However, hers is endowed with so much trauma that we're expecting a strong self-doubt bias from Alison, which is important for later in this analysis, so bear it in mind. Alison, at such a young age, was faced with the murder of her mother and the burden of lying about a murder. I just want to stress to you how intense the pressure she would have been under is mentally, as it's imperative to understand what's going through her head in order to understand where she's coming from. While yes, she is a more credible source than Marianne, her traumatic past is likely a catalyst for self-doubt. As I've mentioned, it's likely some of her memories and feelings towards the house in Marianne may be skewed due to her trauma. She has spent years avoiding therapy and combating her issues in her own head with no outlet due to fear of being outed as a murderer or for ruining Tyler's lie. She has had 10 years of trying to bury the past in her head. She is eager to get rid of the house as it's her last link to the past. 
She wants to sell it quickly because she wants to be rid of every little memory that's plagued her life for the past 10 years. She wants to pretend that she's doing the adult thing and moving on, but she tries to do so without closure. Deep down, Alison has an immense soul sickness that she can't quite evade, and it's her past, murked with the demons that threaten to send the last 10 years with Eddie crumbling down in shambles that ruin her. Alison may be brave, but from that night on the pier, one thing is clear. Her main fear does not manifest in the form of the Mad Hunter or Marianne. It manifests most deeply within herself, because she is alone and terrified of the past. She's scared of her own memories, of things she can't get rid of. So, how does her interpretation of the night measure up, and what can we discern from what she remembers that night? Well, at the start of the game, Alison seems self-assured about what happened during the night, whereas Tyler is the one seemingly seeking answers. This, however, I interpret as a facade. She's not comfortable with what happened, she simply doesn't want to think about it. It is a far easier social thing for her to do, to pretend that things are okay and deny and to keep up the image that she is confident in her defense of her brother, rather than to express she's been having doubts. When Tom reveals his side of the story, Alison comments that she doesn't remember what happened fully, or rather doesn't want to, and Tom brings this strong image to the forefront. We'll get back into that later. Alison's assessment of that night is that she leans towards Tom telling the truth at the end of the game. She begins to get over her fear as the past as she confronts the possibility, but even outside of her mental torture, how likely is it that she would have been able to tell what Marianne was saying or doing? From Alison's perspective, don't forget, she ran out of the house when she heard Tyler screaming from the path outside with a pair of scissors in her hand. Bear in mind that it was cold and rainy, even with the lightning going on. Alison would not have been able to see or hear very well given the weather conditions. There is quite a long way for her to be running, and she saw Marianne on the pier with a gun aimed at Tyler in some way or another, and she acted. Now, what does this mean for our investigation? Well, Alison is a character that has gone through a lot of pain. As we said at the beginning, we can trust her judgement more than Marianne because she's alive and with us as the game's events progress. I think that from the information Alison gives us, we cannot discern what happened. Her past is too endowed with the trauma that crawls through her mind. She's having delusions because of it. She can't remember rightly what happened that night, and even says herself that she's unsure. Any attempt in her mind to be swayed one way or the other is not actually coming to a conclusion, but more so choosing which version of the story she prefers. She can believe Tom, and finally get some closure, even if it's false, on the thing that she's been doubting herself on for over 10 years. Or, alternatively, she can choose to stick with her brother and hold on to the memory which grants her a bit of peace of mind and try and live with it. The thing is though, Alison's version of events pokes a perfect hole in Tom's story. Say it with me, Tom Vecchi is a fucking crook. The fact that Tom is able to plant the adult way of looking at the story in Alison's mind might make her more susceptible to believing him. Think of how Alison has always known Tom, the mild-mannered businessman, the one who manages the finances, the happily married man to Tessa, the one who has the dorky plushies for his campaign. She sees him as an adult, her boss, a figure she can usually trust in. Alison is only 21 years old, and honestly, coming from a 19-year-old, she probably still doesn't see herself as very adult yet. In comparison to somebody like Tom, he can still provide some answers. She has slowly gone from wanting to bury the past to desperately seeking some kind of answer. She needs closure, and so perhaps in some deep part of her, she does want to believe Tom, because he seems like an outsider to the situation, an objective voice, someone with reason behind him. But, it's important to remember that this is not true. Tom is just as deeply rooted within the story as the twins and Marianne are, and the only reason I'm inclined to trust his viewpoint at all is from the fact that he was an adult when this took place and is likely to retain a better memory of it, versus the twins who both had developing brains at the time. Whether Tom retained any trauma is based up to the interpretation of his character, whether you think he actually cared about Marianne or not, whether her death could have invoked trauma. Personally, I think he might have been upset and regretful, but he did not care about her enough to feel any deep sense of sadness afterwards. On the contrary, I think it was somewhat of a perfect storm for him. If he cared about Marianne, he'd have helped her and offered her some kind of child support, which he didn't. He would have gone into the lake to help her. He wouldn't have ran away like a coward. He condemned her to die way before her death in the early months of 2005, when she was barely getting by, needing to employ underhanded methods like stealing to feed her kids, which we do find in the police files. 
Tom, as a character, is mostly related back to Alison as her boss, and this relationship is very important to consider when taking into account what he tells her on the night. It's not unreasonable to assume that Alison and Tom have at least spoke about the night Marianne died before, even if it's just in passing. Tom clearly notices that Alison is deeply perturbed about something the morning he visits her house in Chapter 3. He knows that they're on the brink of finding out something, and I don't know, maybe it's just a part of my brain that immensely distrusts politicians, but I'm not believing for a second that Tom isn't, as Tyler suggests, deeply thinking of his campaign tanking during this entire revelation. It's precisely why he tries to burn down Marianne's barn, why he tries to play into Alison's nature, and so we get along to Tom Vecchi and his role in what happened. Tom Vecchi allegedly came to Marianne's house to check on her as he was worried. This already seems incredibly out of character for Tom, and his character is already sketchy as hell. Let's bear in mind here that Tom, in the face of the scandal of him and Marianne coming out into the public, is mostly concerned with how Tessa will view him. He hasn't even thought about the fact that Shirani knows, showing how little he truly does care about other people. He says that there are a whole lot of lives at stake, but really, who is he referring to? himself. Tom has lied for years and years about this, and if you don't think he would lie just to protect the secret one more time, I raise you the argument that if Tom ever intended on coming clean about this, he would've. What he is trying to do so desperately is damage control, just as he has been these last 10 years. The story follows what we know of Tyler running away from Marianne from Tom's perspective, but I'd like to raise one specific point to you. I mentioned earlier that Alison can't have had much of an idea about what Marianne was saying on the pier. This is where Tom Vecchi's story begins to fall apart. I want you to answer to me how Tom could hear what Marianne was saying to Tyler in the midst of a stormy night with the water splashing about, thunder and lightning, as well as the deafening impact of fear. Tom is clearly a scared coward in this scenario and mostly for himself. His justification for not helping Marianne is not fear for her kids or that she didn't deserve to die in a lake, it was that he was personally scared. What of? I don't know. Did he truly think, in some reach of his mind, that Tyler and Allison were a threat to him? Did he think that the woman who had a stab wound and was drowning was going to kill him? I don't know. Tom Vecchi is a crook. Decide it for yourself. I want to know now how it's possible whatsoever that Tom could have heard Marianne say, I'm not going to hurt you. Even from Tyler's perspective, it's a quiet little voice line amidst the storm. Tom is ages away when it happens, and I even noticed earlier that Alison would have a hard time that was getting the gist of what happening, and she was closer. So how did Tom hear Marianne that night? The simple answer is that he didn't. Tom did not hear what happened on the pier, and so we cannot take what he is saying with that kind of value. He can't know what happened on the pier because he simply wouldn't have heard it. Remembering that he has poor eyesight, all he would have seen is Marianne walking after Tyler with a gun in hand, seeing Alison stab her from behind, and then running away. It's a reasonable conclusion then that he would not see this as an act of self-defence, and he knows that Tyler is the one who took the blame, but he is specifically referring to Marianne having a different attitude, and I think this is where his manipulative part of the story plays in. He did not hear what she said. I think it's important to take a moment here to blame Tom for Marianne's death. Her stab wound was non-fatal, Tom easily could have saved her from drowning, if he had stayed to help her. But he didn't, out of a misplaced fear for himself. Tom's personal motivation is something to heavily be brought to the forefront of your mind when thinking of how Marianne died. Notice how he paints the story. Alison is a killer who hid the truth from herself. Remember when I told you about Alison's immense self-doubt? Her need for therapy? Tom knows this all too well, he sees her every day, he's watched her bottle up the truth for so many years, and he threatens to put out her secret if she puts out his. In this context given, he is threatening her, a person who was 11 years old when this happened, and he holds her to the same degree of accountability as a grown man, preying on the mentally ill, struggling woman of the town. He shies away from the responsibility for his actions and immediately pins it on Alison, blaming her for what she did as a child, for what she did when she had such little information, and threatening to ruin her reputation for what easily could have been an honest mistake, because she wants to expose him for being a selfish scumbag. There is an immense difference between Alison and Tom, because she wants closure while he wants to sweep it under the rug. He is preying on her. Remember Tom's manipulative tactics? Alison mentions this in chapter 3. Pay close attention to the phrasing in this conversation. Tom says, She was unhinged. Something like this would have happened sooner or later. 
and Alison then responds with, That was convenient for you, huh? You preyed on her because she was vulnerable, and you knew you could always blame it on crazy Marianne Ronan if you got caught. Now I'd like you to do something for me. Replace that sentence with blame it on crazy murderer Alison Ronan, and you have Tom's exact tactic. Tom is not merely threatening to put out his secret as revenge, he is planning to use it to undermine Alison's accusations, the exact same way he would have done with Marianne. If he can put out the secret that she murdered her mother and portray her as a child psychopath who murdered her mother for no reason and lied about it, as he mentions sarcastically her self-defense story, he will be able to get away with less damage to his campaign. The way Tom sees this, it's all about damage control. His ideal scenario is that he can convince Alison it was her fault, and his backup plan if she doesn't believe him is that he'll convince the town that it was her fault and use it to undermine her. He wants to make her the town loony and use this to save face in respect of the upcoming election. Tom Vecchi is a crook. That much is confirmed. While his version of the story may make sense, Marianne's does not. Marianne does not play by convention, but then would she really kill her children? The only place we can look to is the man himself, Tyler Ronan, for more answers. Tyler has had years to think on the truth. He knows it. And while he lives a lie, it's not nearly as damaging as Alison's. He lives with the lie that he took the blame for his sister. Obviously, Tyler's transition has taken a mental toll in his earlier years as he expresses a lot of frustration in memories, but as a grown adult, he seems self-assured and confident, and he seems to work through a great deal of his traumas from the night of Marianne's death. He is able to face that peer with far more courage than his sister, solely for the reason that he has allowed time for his thoughts to simmer out in the open, whereas Alison has had years of bottling it up. They are two sides of the same coin, foils to each other if you will. So could Tyler offer the most clarity in this situation? As a person with the least to gain, the least to lose, is he somewhat of an objective figure? Well, yes and no. Let's start on young Tyler, a boy who is, at his core, younger and arguably less close to Marianne. She has taken his diary, a very personal breach of privacy, and whether she was doing that with good intentions or not, it was his lifeline, and if he was not ready to confide in Marianne that he was trans, then that was always his choice to make, no matter how young he was, and she seriously overstepped this boundary. This is wrong, regardless. But the point remains that even though Tyler has had a very hard life, he's probably the closest we have to any form of objective person in this scenario. Okay, it might be wrong to say objective, but perhaps least biased fits the situation better. However, Tyler's story does and always will have a glaring flaw in it in terms of his version of the truth, and it's not so much rooted in trauma, but in fear. That said, there is still some information we can discern from his side of the story, which is the truth we're presented with from the game's get-go. Tyler is the one who has the most perception of the night Marianne died. He was the one who invaded on her loading the gun, he was the one who ran from her, and he was ultimately the one who pleaded for his life on the end of the pier. Unlike Alison or Tom, who only saw bits and pieces of the altercation, he was there for all of it. And there is only one other person who saw this that can be said for, and that's Marianne, who is currently six feet under, so I'm not entirely I'm entirely sure we could get her educated opinion on whether she was going to kill her kids that night. Isn't that exactly why I'm making this video? So, when considering Tyler, as we've had with all other characters, it's so important to focus on him as a person, and specifically his attitude to his mother when he was younger. Now, it's obvious that we as the player know that Marianne's breakdown that night had nothing to do with Tyler cutting his hair. In fact, it seems that Marianne was ultimately supportive of Tyler. She is branched out from a conservative family, attended art classes, buying books that would have been ridiculously rare in 2005 when trans rights discussions were far and few in between, especially compared to 2015, and even addressing him by the name Ollie in her letter to the twins. She was certainly to some degree okay with it. What's important to consider though, is that from Tyler's perspective, he had no idea. Plenty of youth can confuse the feelings of others because their brains just haven't socially developed yet to interpret nuance that way. He hadn't seen the book and there's no way of him knowing. Tyler seemed to have interpreted his mother's stress during the last few months of her life as if they were connected to him being trans. We know from an outside perspective, and Tyler knows as an adult, that Marianne had far more to deal with, which was a mountain to her stress. But until midway through chapter one, Tyler still holds the belief that Marianne freaked out because of his haircut. So what was going through Tyler's head? Likely repressed fear from Marianne. Many children who go through having a parent who is emotionally unavailable will often feel like a burden. 
Think of how Tyler feels when he asks Marianne about joining the hockey team or getting a haircut. Marianne is cold and withdrawn from him, and so Tyler, in his mother's words, begins shutting her out as he thinks, and I don't think that this is an unfair interpretation to make given the information he has on the table. So, him shutting her out leads her to suspect something is the matter, and she begins to pry through his personal diary for a trace of what may be wrong. This is an ultimate breach of Tyler's trust, and as a young trans boy, Tyler is in need of that trust in that moment, possibly more than his entire life. In LGBT youth, it's statistically proven that those who grow up with their boundaries and trust respected are far less likely to develop trauma in relation to their sexual or gender identity, and are far more likely to come out in a healthy way to friends and family, rather than repress and hide themselves. It's true of anything, really. Invading on your child's life will make them naturally apprehensive and untrustworthy, and it can manifest in behaviours as small as tilting your phone away from somebody when someone else is nearby, or it can go as extreme to people developing personality disorders. Now consider that all of this apprehension and fear of Marianne's disapproval at Tyler being trans, and consider his impression of her seeing his hair cut. Tom and Allison aside, Tyler would have been absolutely swept away with fear when he saw his mother turn around with the gun. He was already terrified to show her the haircut. Traumatic memories are malleable and prone to distortion. Allison in particular struggles from memory amplification, possibly remembering that night as a lot more traumatic than it really was for her, and warping events so that she does indeed experience delusions many years later. Tyler's warped sense of events, however, is unlike this. As if he is warping a perception, he was not doing it through trauma, but through fear in the moment. He did run away from Marianne in fear of his life, and that's not a fact that's up for debate. The only thing that's up for debate is Marianne. Tyler is not remembering being scared differently. He was scared, and he was begging for his life in every single version of the memory, and so you can discount the trauma from his story, and this is the prime difference between him and Allison. Every version of the story has Tyler running in fear. You can't make that up. He was scared in the moment. What we have to discern from this is that Marianne absolutely scared Tyler. What we also have to look at though, is how predisposed Tyler was towards feeling scared of his mother figure, who he assumes the worst about. He thinks, at this point in the story, that he is going to be killed. So that begs the question, was Tyler's fear of not being accepted for who he is, overriding Marianne's pleas, or was she truly hunting him down with a rifle, ready to kill? There is evidence both ways, for sure, but I'd say that it's more likely that he was actually in fear of her. Even towards the end, she didn't necessarily harbour any violent feelings towards him that would make him feel that way. And as far as we know, she never physically disciplined her children, and while stressed, she never did anything that would allude to this. Even the townsfolk admitted that Marianne's death and the way she died was a huge shock to everybody. Tyler had never seen Marianne in such a state before, and so it could be argued that he was simply scared and assumed violent intentions. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that to some degree, his fear was justified. But there is still one major thing that completely stabs a perfectly scissor-sized hole in Tyler's story. The voice. I'm going to kill you is the last line that we hear differently in each of the memories. The twin's memory of the story has Marianne saying this, but Alison rightly mentions that the voice has a habit of repelling and throwing about phrases previously heard that are relevant to the situation, typically in very emotionally intensive scenarios. Tyler's line, you have to accept responsibility for your part in Marianne's death, is echoed back to Alison in a moment when she is directly running away from her responsibility in Marianne's death. I think there's an interesting thing to consider here though. Marianne had never been a part of the voice before, and it's literally never mentioned. The only thing is that the secret keeper gave it to the goblins in the book, and Marianne likely knows that they have something going on. You'd expect her to notice these things about her kids. You know, we know from their memory that this is what she said to Tom Vecchi the night he came out on the boat to see her. So, out of the two possible scenarios that the voice has done this, what are the key takeaways? When it's thrown back at Allison, it's from Tyler, something that already had been said previously in the day. Really, this was at a time when Allison may have really needed to hear it. She does need to accept her part in the death in order to heal and move on. So, was this simply a mental projection from Allison? We know that her powers have invoked interpersonal delusions that commentate on her life before at the start of chapter 3, so could this be a similar thing? If so, could this be interpreted as a fear of Tyler's from seeing Marianne holding the same gun in the same place, given the context of the two scenarios? 
Now, the alternative theory, which is very interesting, is that Marianne truly did have something to do with it, because think, the twins could never see their memories before with their power. This much is made clear in chapter one. This is a new element to their power that has developed while they've been apart from each other and grown up. So it's ruled out of possibility that Tyler is simply hearing the memory of Marianne threatening Tom. Could it be that Marianne is the one throwing back the line at Tyler? It seemed that Tyler was frustrated that Allison was giving up that night, and could it be the line, you need to accept responsibility in Marianne's death, was brought up with the voice? If so, this has very interesting implications, in the fact that the I'm going to kill you could also be contextually relevant to Tyler. It does seem a little echoed as if the voice might be at play, and so this would certainly explain why Tom Vecchi never heard it. This is just theory talk at this point, but if Marianne is connected to the voice, this would serve as an explanation. We never actually see her open her mouth to say these words from a game perspective. We only ever see the gun, a cinematographically similar technique to what Don't Nod use when the twins are using their voice, to never show a mouth in order to imply the thought talk. Is there any evidence to suggest that Mary Ann used the voice? No, she's never been mentioned to be a part of it. The only thing that might indicate her involvement is the fact that she does know the twins have it to some degree. But is there any evidence to suggest she didn't? Not really. Tyler didn't have the power of reliving memories, and why would Alison throw this line back to Tyler? The only small thing that could change this is Tyler's core fear, but he definitely heard this, whether it was real or part of the voice. At the end of the day, if you came to this video looking for a concrete answer, I'm very sorry to disappoint you in saying that there's simply never going to be one that's provided to us. That's what makes the ending of this game so interesting, that no matter what ending you picked, you'll never know. There's never a grand reveal about which choice was right or wrong. You're placed into a similar situation as Allison and Tyler, in that no matter how much you try and weigh up the evidence, you're never going to quite find that golden gem of information that gives you the closure. You're going to have to find it within yourself to truly believe whichever of the story feels most real to you. But that would be a shitty end to the video. And so if you do want my genuine opinion on what happened, please don't take this too seriously because this is just the conclusion that I've reached, which is both wrong and correct at the same time because there is not a never will be a correct answer to this. I do think that Marianne intended to take her children to the grave with her, and that Tom's story is solely playing on Alison's trauma. I think that Marianne was somehow involved with the voice, as it has always been an altogether inconsistent power. And during this moment, Marianne felt the same feeling in her chest from the night before, when she had seen Tom on the pier. In the same way that Tyler wanted to tell Allison to accept reality and break through the mental barrier as he did with Eddie, though the contexts were a bit different, Marianne wanted to kill Tyler on the pier, even if it was with a fucked up sense of love. I know it can be a bit disheartening to believe Tom's story of events, but please try to remember that he is just a crooked politician, and that Allison was just a little girl when all this is happening. She had no way of knowing what was really happening or not. She was just scared and petrified out of her mind. You can't hold her, as Tom does, to the standard of an adult or a killer. If you choose to believe his story of events, do not think worse of Allison for it. Think worse of Tom for threatening her with something that wasn't her fault. Think worse of him for implicating her and threatening her. And try to bear in mind that in the end, Alison isn't wholly responsible for what happened. Marianne was ready to kill herself in that barn regardless of whether she took her children with her or not, and had Tyler not found her that night with the shotgun, she likely would have been dead anyway, and they would likely blame themselves for not being there for her. The grass is truly always greener on the other side, and I think that the main takeaway from this is that the Ronan twins are stronger for their grievances. And with that, I think I'm finally done. I've said everything I want to on the topic, so, did we reach the satisfying conclusion? Did I Sherlock Holmes the shit out of Don't Nod Entertainment as I sometimes could do with List 2? No, I didn't. And that's okay, because tell me why it's proven throughout its release that some mysteries you'll never truly understand. It does us no good to mess with the past, as a certain time traveller will tell you, and as a pair of Wolf Brothers would add, the most important thing is that you keep moving forward. I'm sure the Ronan twins will learn these lessons and grow into strong adults together, whichever version of the story you choose to believe. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know I joke a lot about my upload schedule, but it took a lot out of me to make this video. I've been struggling a lot with motivation lately, but I still get such lovely messages from people, comments on my videos, which remind me that it's worth striving to do more videos, and I hope that the future is bright for making more content. I won't bore you too much with the details, but your comments really do make my day sometimes. Thank you. A special thank you to my patrons for their monetary support, it is much appreciated, their names are on the screen right now, and they are a beautiful bunch of people. 
please be sure to like this video if you enjoyed. Tell me what ending you got and what you think about what happened that night. Is Tom Vecchi as much of an insufferable crook as the game paints him to be? Was Tyler right to be scared of Marianne? What do you think of Alison's response to the whole situation? Let me know. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this, and with that said, remember to keep your cucumbers serrated, and have a sweet day. Bye!